The Old Testament spans over 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. Genesis chapters 1 to 11 covers the prehistoric period, which includes the creation of the universe, the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, the flood, and finally, the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 to 4. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. The first scene begins with a eastward movement to the plain in Shinar. As a result, the story's events began in a land west of Babylon. After being cast out of God's presence, the man and woman, as well as Cain, moved eastward. Lot moved toward the east after separating from Abraham. When a man travels east, he departs from the land of blessing, Eden and the promised land, for a land where his hopes will be dashed, Babylon and Sodom. Everyone wanted to make a name for themselves. Name also refers to reputation, fame, or renown in the Old Testament. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Babel or Babylon was the name given to the location. The word is Akkadian in origin and means gateway to a god. Jacob's stairway was also referred to as the gate of heaven. According to verse 4, the people desired to build a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. The name Babel means God's gate. However, the only way into the presence of Almighty God is through faith in Jesus Christ. Every man-made attempt to enter God's presence will fail, because we enter the heavenly gate by faith alone in Christ alone, which is directly contrary to God's will. The people were constructing a tower to honor a false religion. Many consider the Tower of Babel to be the first ziggurat. Ziggurats were massive structures with steps that, in their opinion, brought people closer to the God they worshipped. Although the word Babel means gate of God, it was not built to get closer to the one true God, but revealed in the pages of the Bible. It was built in opposition to Him. Throughout Assyria and Babylon, Many ziggurats have been discovered and excavated. At the top of the ziggurat, which would often reach 300 feet or more, there would be a place to offer sacrifices to the false gods whom the people worshipped. Another way the people defied God's will when they built the Tower of Babel was that they did so with impure motives. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, they said in verse 4. The tower was a work of pride. The tower was constructed to showcase human achievement. Instead of singing, How Great Thou Art, the crowd chanted, How Great We Are. One of the recurring themes in the Bible is a God will humble the proud. Human pride directly opposes God's will only God's name should be glorified and magnified. 
Every believer's attitude should be remodeled after that of John the Baptist, who said of Jesus Christ, He must increase, but I must decrease. And I am unworthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. Nonetheless, human pride continues to oppose the Lord's will to this day. Instead of making a name for ourselves, we are to exalt the name of Jesus. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, It is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. God promises Abram in the following chapter of Genesis, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. That promise was made not only to Abram, but to all who, like Abraham, have saving faith in the Lord. Every name in the Lamb's Book of Life reflects the greatness of the One who has redeemed us from sin, reconciled us to our Heavenly Father, and will usher us through the gates of heaven into the yet-to-be-revealed eternal city. Another way that people rejected doing God's will and strive to do their own is in the final part of verse 4 where they say, we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. However, God's plan for the people was for them to be dispersed throughout the world. God's will for Noah and his descendants was to populate the earth. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 1 we read, How God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The same command was given in Genesis chapter 9, verse 7. When we look at those passages, we see that they are echoing the command that the Lord had given to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God's will as expressed to Adam and Eve as well as to Noah and his descendants was for all humanity to spread out across the globe, to fill the earth by subduing and caring for every part of the world that God had created. But as the people gathered on the plain of Shinar, they had no interest in reaching out around the world to settle in it. They had no interest in caring for the world that God had majestically placed before them. Instead, in verse 4 we read, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. In that declaration, we can see that the people's will was diametrically opposed to God's will. That should not surprise us because humanity will always oppose God's will for them apart from saving grace through faith in Jesus Christ. However, the passage clearly teaches that the Lord's will always triumphs and is unfazed by humanity's efforts to defy His will. This passage can be divided by the uses of the word come. In verse 3, the people said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And the passage goes on to describe how they sought to build a tower reaching into the heavens. However, their attempts were thwarted by the Lord, who also used the word come in verse 7. It is one of the many verses in the Bible that teaches the Trinity without ever mentioning the word. Verse 7 records the Lord saying, Come, let us go down to confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. It was no difficult task for the Lord to halt the progress of the Tower of Babel. The Lord scattered the people across the face of the earth and caused them to stop building the city because the Lord confused the entire world's language. Imagine how amazing that must have been for the people. How surprised they must have been when God appeared and muddled their languages. It was a simple thing for God. His will and His plans could not be stopped. Psalm chapter 33 verses 10 and 11 The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever.
the purposes of his heart through all generations. However, humanity's opposition to the Lord is no match for the eternal God who created man in his own image and established the world and everything in it. Babel and Babylon it is easy to see the connection between Babel and Babylon in English, but it is actually the same root word in Hebrew. There is no doubt about the link. In the pages of the Bible, Babylon represents humanity's opposition to God. Babylon is characterized by sinful pride, with Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon during Daniel's time serving as a prime example. He took great pride in Babylon's power, and the Lord humbled him by making him eat grass like cattle until he acknowledged that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Daniel chapter 4 verse 25 The Bible contains numerous references to Babylon. In Genesis chapter 11, we read about the sinful pride of those who refuse to do God's will and we continue to read about Babylon throughout the Old and New Testaments. Babylon is consistently depicted as humanity rebelling against God and his people. Babylon represents everything bad in the world. In his visions recorded in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, the Apostle John describes Babylon as the great mother of prostitutes and all the abominations of the earth. He describes in great detail how God will punish Babylon. Revelation chapter 18 verses 21 to 24 says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down, and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, Flautists and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you any more, and the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you any more. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. As we realize that Babylon, which represents humanity's sinful pride against God, will be completely destroyed, we must remember that figuratively speaking, all humanity resides either in Babylon or in the New Jerusalem, the city, the place of indescribable beauty that God has prepared for those who have saving faith in Jesus Christ. And it is critical to understand the differences between the two cities, each of which represents humanity's eternal fate. Take into account the differences between the two cities' architects and builders. Babylon was originally settled by Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. The grandson of Ham, who was chastised along with his descendants for mocking his father Noah, when Noah fell into sin. From then on, we can see that Babylon is designed and built by a proud and sinful people who oppose God and his will for their lives. In contrast, the architect of Jerusalem the Golden is none other than God. The New Jerusalem is a heavenly city that represents the place of glory that those who believe in Christ will experience in heaven. According to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10, Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He was looking forward to the new Jerusalem, to heaven in all its glory. When we consider the differences between the two cities' architects and builders, we can easily see that there is a significant difference in the motivation for building and establishing them. Babylon was founded and built out of hatred for God and a desire to destroy Him, out of a desire to worship false gods rather than the one true God revealed in Scripture. God, on the other hand, designed and built Jerusalem above out of love for His people. 
It was with love that the Lord Jesus Christ described how he himself will build a home for those who believe in him. He said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. John chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 The appearance of the two cities is also vastly different. We read about how Babylon, or Babel, was built with bricks and mortar. It was built with bricks and slime according to the old King James Version. The tar mortar was somewhat slimy, especially until it cured and set with time. Babylon, like our violent and decaying cities, lacks lasting beauty. In contrast, there are no words to describe the beauty of our heavenly home. Revelation chapter 21 describes it through the use of numerous precious jewels in order to convey that the beauty of our heavenly home is so great that as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 Another significant difference between the two cities is their duration. Babylon will be completely destroyed, as described in Revelations chapter 17 and 18. The heavenly city, on the other hand, will last forever, because it is the eternal God's home, and the home of all who are reconciled to him by grace through faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. The Gospel in Our Own Tongue Every year on Pentecost, we are reminded that the same God who confused people's languages can also give people of every dialect and language the ability to hear the Gospel in their own language and, through God's power, believe the Gospel that they hear. After all, that is what happened on Pentecost. According to Acts chapter 2, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven were gathered together when the Holy Spirit came with power and they began to hear the gospel in their own language. Acts chapter 2 verse 6 explains how when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? What they heard was the gospel, and they heard it in their own language. When Peter spoke to the crowd, he described how Jesus Christ was crucified because of God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge. He described how everyone is guilty before God, but God sacrificed his son and raised him to glory so that all who believe in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. On the day of Pentecost, the people heard the gospel in their own language. Have you heard the good news? Have you heard the call to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just with your ears, but with your heart? Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of the Holy Spirit's conviction and regenerating power? Both Babylon and Jerusalem are summarized in John chapter 3 verse 36. Both eternal judgment and everlasting life in heaven. John writes, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life for God's wrath remains on him. If you believe in the Son with saving faith, you are given entrance into the city for square. Your citizenship is in heaven, and your faith in Christ will never prevent you from entering. May that describe your and my faith today and always. The author's focus 
this being on both God's plan to bless humankind by providing them with that which is good, and human failure to trust God and enjoy the good God had provided since the first chapters of Genesis. The attempt by humans to grasp the good on their own has been a defining feature of this failure. The author's description of God's blessing is centered on the gift of land. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 The place of blessing is the good land. To leave this land in search of another is to forego the blessing of God's good provisions. It means living east of Eden.